far as I remember last time, you just fought off a bunch of post-apocalyptic bikers who were trying to kidnap children out of the back of your four gigantic digger steampunk car things. Basically, the, uh, the van has gone tits again. They've loaded the van onto the back of one of these things. You've got to try and find a way to get home from what you could determine from the uh, data readouts on it. You're in something called a, a, a time slip dimension. So there's like something wrong with it, basically. Uh, it's got kind of a, di a universe between universes sort of thing, which is why everything's a bit weird. You are trying to find a way home, like Sam Beckett in Quantum Leap. Oh, <laughs> God. So the base, basically what happens is the, the crew of the giant APCs all leap off a Mad Max style scavenge the remains of what the can from the bikes. The, the... I, I apologise if some of them are a bit flat. Yeah, some of them are a little flat. And there's a bunch of those weird base men things, which uh, uh, kind of look like they're from an 80s B movie that are, uh, are scattered about. That uh, Some of them are very flat and some of them have been shot. What they do is they, they strip them from everything that they're worth and they climb back into the, the giant trucks. So Andy was driving... The back one now because he changed position. Uh, are you all riding with Andy on that one? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Uh, and if I me driving's not that bad. If I recall <laughs> correctly, they'd lost a bunch of gunners uh, when fighting off this bite the gang. So now they don't have enough gunners for all of the all of the APCs. Right. So with a slow groan and rattle, the uh, the APCs get up to speed. After five kilometres, uh, you see a, a large band of Roman refugees. They were identified by tattered uniforms scattering in every direction. The numbers on the backs are dark orange and they've got parallel slash martins indicating Kylan slaves. The sort of the sea of them parts to one side as these great big APCs chug past, but the Crew-wise, they're pretty much rammed to capacity, so they kind of a few people try to jump on, and they're waved off by the crew, saying, "You know, it, you're only going to fall off and get squashed under the tracks." And that's not because of Andy's driving. <laughs> you're good. Can you remind us where we're going? Because I can vaguely remember, but not quite. And you are trying to beat the humongous, who's called Kyland. In this dimension, but he's basically the humongous from Mad Max. You are trying to beat him to the last city port. Oh, that's right. Because he's coming with a big army in his personal steam powered airship, apparently. Do you just drive past all these refugees then? You just chug along and, and shoo them out the way, kind of thing? Well, un un unless that lasso who's in charge tells us to stop, I do. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm just following the vehicle. Yeah, so you slowly grind your way across the shattered landscape, and and then after a little while, you you hear it muttering among the uh, the crew and the passengers of the the machine that you're on, uh, and the whisper in uh, horror, it's a horror, uh, and the way the the way they're saying it, the sound uh, terrified. Wasn't there something following us? There is something following you. Or specifically following Earl it's some giant oh that octopusy thing octopusy thing yeah uh, the uh, yeah, the gunners yeah. look, look nervous and touch the handles of their machine guns nervously I go ask them you know I, you know, describing this thing is, is that a horror or something else no monsieur that's a rib splitter a rolling horror is a, a gigantic amorphous tube of flesh it's about 30 feet long, um, it absorbs bodies and it eats people and then it extrudes the bodies out through its flesh it, it's right. on tendrils like kind of armour or or something just to scare people. The bodies that are extruded, uh, they still have some kind of life in them because they scream and howl and wail and we're not sure whether to be put out of the misery or, or whether they're just in such pain. Okay, and uh, why has everybody suddenly gone scared? Are, are we near one, or...? Yes, monsieur, apparently 
we're, we're near the uh, the hunting grounds of one. Uh, people that have been this way before uh, have, have seen them in the distance. Okay. Keep an eye, eye open. Yeah, you um, so you motor on. You don't see anything. After a further hour, you rise up between two rolling hills. You your speed is slowed down as you try to mount the steep hills. The lady calls you over and she says, "Over there, there's a village chapel on the uh, the hill. It used to be used as a a way station for Kylan's airship." Housing ammunition and canned food, um, but we've we've the, like you've pulled up and uh, she says we look through the binoculars and it all seems quiet. Can we tell if Kylan's been here already, or are we ahead of him? Ah, uh, we, we are ahead of the army still, as there would be all all manner of hell would rain down upon us. Just out of curiosity. In comparison to this vehicle that we are in, yes. What size is it compared to a horror? A horror is about the size of one of those big whales, um, and about thirty feet long. Right, that's all right. I'm just checking. I don't know whether we should risk going for trying to get some cans of food, or whether we should just go around. What do you think? Well, we could always. Um... Basically, loot the place and leave a few little surprises for people. For when, for when Carl turns. How much do you need the canned food? Well, we, we're not desperate for it. If we keep on low rations, we should have enough to reach the city, but we'll run out shortly after we reach there. So if there's any, any problems once we get there, we're in deep mud, as they say. <laughs> and I take it there's no way of driving these vehicles up to the way station. Oh yeah, you could just drive the vehicles completely straight up to the way station. But it used to be like an armoured sort of mini fortress with uh, like the tower used to have a, a winch on to attach the airship. Um, so no, you can actually yeah, you can absolutely just drive them straight. Because all I'm thinking is it would be the ideal time, wouldn't it, for one of these horrors to turn up while we're all wandering about on two legs. Well away from the safety of the vehicles. At least if we take the vehicles <laughs> over there, we've got some way of defending ourselves and the rest of these people. If one turns up while we're having a bit scrabble about for tins of food. Yeah. Is it normally manned? Yeah, yeah. It's like a, a, a mini Mad Maxian fortress with like walls with barbed wire around and and build out of old bricks and oh, old so planks. They've probably, so they've probably spotted us already. Well, you you take the you take the binoculars off and you have a good look and you can't see any movement. There's tracks streaking through the long uncut grass are about the size of those motorcycles, and it looks like they were coming towards you by the way that they've been flattened. But you squashed all the motorcycles and killed everybody in a a magnificent show of aptitude, which is why so she's asking you. So with a bit of luck, these dozer blades on the front of the APCs will take care of the gate of this fort. Oh yeah, certainly the size of it, it'll just it'll just crash through. And if not, the the grabbing arm of the gate up. Um, the machine guns on these APCs, how effective would they be against one of these rolling holes? Uh, not well enough, she says. Uh, they can work if you're lucky. So what say you? Time is passing. We have to get there as quickly as possible. Well, if the lady thinks we should go, we'll follow her. Mm-hmm. But, but I'm not the, the reason they're asking you is uh, you obviously can handle yourselves as you were uh, dealt with all of those raiders in a military manner, whereas these guys just sort of bumble through, which is why they took mm. so many losses, which is why she values your opinion. She says, I think we've got to risk it. If we get to the city and the gates are down or the army beats us there, we're not going to have enough food to get anywhere else. That's fine. That's fine. That's that's what we needed to know. If if she thinks we need the food, we'll go and get the food. Are you driving your just yours over, or do you think the whole convoy should drive over in a big? I can't remember how you're supposed to do this, but I, I think somebody should at least stay where we are now as like top cover or whatever it is they call it. Overwatch. That's the fella. Ah, oh, why don't we, right, 
Uh-huh. Cause they've stripped all the uh, everything off these beasties and and the bikes, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Why don't we why don't we put them on their clothes on the front one? We'll go we'll go th- first and then we we'll might get lucky and they might think, Oh, it's our raiding party coming back, they've captured all the things and just open the gates. Hey, it's worth a try. It's definitely worth a try. And then we shoot them all dead. <laughs> well yeah. Uh yeah, go for it. Uh you roll the vehicle forward, Andy, and as you get closer you can see that uh, like I said, there's a, a compound built around it with all all bricks and uh, planks of wood with barbed wire all over the top and like crude wooden sharpened stakes. The front gate and part of the the wall seems to have been torn down at the front, and there's no sign of life. Uh, the tracks lead oh, out yeah. from the way station through the grass, but towards towards you. So it looks like those bikers that you squashed came from here. Drive over and you pull up to a stop next to the destroyed front gear. It's basically a church where the like the the views the remains of the wall to to build up the the fence around it, and then there's a there's like scaffold near the top and it's got the the winch and a moor in the airship. How um, similar to the Alamo does this look like? <laughs> I'd say pretty similar. Has this gate been destroyed inwards or outwards? Uh, it's been destroyed inwards. Do we take the APC in or do we leave it here? Or do we carefully reverse it in so we can use the dozer blade on the front to plug the hole left by that knackered gate? We've... Uh... Most of the machine guns are on the back, so if there's anybody inside the church, they're going to get nasty. Right, it's all quiet. So you reverse it in and, and plug the hole with a bulldozer blade as best you can. Um, yeah. Dismounting, you, you command the stalkers to keep keep this heavy steam on. We might have to get out of here quickly. Yeah. Yeah. There's basically the, the old chapel in front of you, which is in reasonably good nick comparatively. And there's obviously surrounded by the, the graveyard at the back. Nothing like a good graveyard, is there? Oh, you can of bite a good graveyard. <laughs> Out of curiosity, do I reckon... You know that grabby, craney thing on the back? Yes. Do I reckon that would bring down the tower that's got the winch on for the airship? Uh, yeah, you could probably pull it down with that. It is pretty powerful. It's a big digger thing. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking ahead in case we need to. I mean, it's probably powerful enough to crash the entire thing into the church and bring part of it down because it's massive. Uh, can I have a careful look around the place to see if there's been any recent fighting? Is there any, you know, casings, blood trails, anything? Yeah, go ahead. You carefully search the area. Big holes in the ground where rolling horrors cut all out of. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's five, it's a good one. So you, you scan around the area. Outside, it does look like there was a couple of people that are trying to have a fight. There's, there is some empty shell casings and the ground's all churned up where it looks like the, the fighting was. But the, there's no blood and there's no body bits. And You can see through the open door of the church. Uh, inside, there's like piles of equipment and things like that, but the, there's no sign of anybody. Uh, you have never heard anything else. It's going to be like tremors when we walk on the ground. Yet. <laughs> so stepping into the church, there's, a, like I said, there's a big pile of coal in one corner. There's some spare parts and there's a, a massive pile of tinned food. Most of it doesn't have labels on it. It's a little bit rusty, but it's certainly better than what these people have normally been in. Oh, awesome. Culinary roulette. Yeah. <laughs> right, we'll get to start loading the stuff in, in teams. No, nobody goes anywhere alone. Cause yeah. Like normally you um normally when you go places it's all shiny and metallic and great looking and, and this is all sort of everything it's sl- it starts to drizzle as you start to um load cans and coal and th- and things like that into the back of the the APC. We well, might as well try and take the spare parts and all. There might be some use to us. So you spend about 
45 minutes loading everything up. Yeah. We'll put um, we'll put guys watching out for, outside as well in case anything you know sneaks up on us. So. You're just about finished. You've got it all almost done, and then there's a, a horrifying scream comes from down the hill in the direction that the other ones are there. And when the guys start shouting, horror, horror. I shall leap back into the APC. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I can't exactly say start the engine because it's steam powered. (laughs) Well, yeah, the stokers have kept it uh, ticking over because obviously, you know, otherwise you'd have been there a fortnight. Uh, Right, well, everybody aboard. Uh, I bet we've got no flame weapons on this thing, have we? No, you've got a Vickers machine gun, like a World War One Vickers machine gun. Just what I've got in me sparring. And what <laughs> and what Andy's got in his sparring, because he's always got something to burn. No, a lot of infinite supply of Molotovs. And... Yeah. <laughs> we'd we'd uh, better go and lend a hand, but let's just have that uh, airship tower down on the way out. Give us a forceful roll as you try to smash the tower down with the grabber. It's a three, it's good. Dave, uh, there's a great as the digger arm comes up, crashes in through the uh, roof of the the church and then sort of sweeps across the roof, pulling the rest of the tiles off. And then it, it crashes into the tower, which sort of wavers for a, a few times and then just starts crashing down in, into the graveyard. Dave was, yep, right, I've got that. <laughs> right, I shall floor it and head back to where the rest of the people are and where this person is screaming about horrors can we see it right yes as you pull out you see this enormous pulsating tube of flesh with sort of amorphous tendrils coming at it on the end of the tendrils there's like you see an arm and then another one you'll see a head with the mouth open and screaming a third one has like three quarters of a torso with one arm but nothing else but the arms like flailing about as if it's still animated mm-hmm. And it yeah. roll looks to be about the same speed as the uh, APC is its top speed, but it rolls slowly towards you, screaming and howling. So can I please have some some rolls? Which Any rolls particular that sort of roll you'd like? I would like, yes, I would. Jam roll? A ja- I would love a jam roll. I'm going to say forceful, actually. For your sheer force of will, uh, as your mind is like blown by how repulsive this thing is and should not exist. And if needs be, I'll uh, I'll invoke my aspect of being a goblin's diehard because I'm not having it. I don't like things like this. I'm the- I get a four. So basically, your mind is is so incredibly horrified. Uh, Andy spends a fair point, thus bringing it to a five. Uh, and you just do that thing, you know, where you, you bite your fist up and like bite on your knuckles for a little bit. Uh, yep. uh, Dave, you just start uh, screaming and sh- business as usual. Business as usual, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you are going to actually take, unless you're going to do anything about it. Um, um, can I uh, have a re roll and spend a fate point? You certainly can, my friend. Is it plus two per fate roll or what? Right, so uh, a re-roll is one fate point, and then if you can justify you anything else to give you an extra plus two, you can't just say I'm spending a fate point for plus two. You have to, you have to justify it. Or I remember the stories that Earl was telling me about about the, the about the um, unseely high court. Evil fairies. Evil fairies, Dave. Even e- evil fairies are, are not as horrifying as this thing. The, it, as it rolls forward, the tendrils sort of go flop, flop, and it and it rolls over them, and you see this head that like is screaming and looking you directly in the eyes as it's sucked underneath it, and then it comes round like. Um, <laughs> right, so so Dave, you cower at the bottom of the uh, APC for a few seconds, unable to act, but. You pull yourself together and you stand upright and flee. You've got a three as well. Mm-hmm. So what are you going to do? Are you going to do anything? Up? Because otherwise you're going to actually take a one-point shift of psychic horror damage. No, I'll just spend the fifth point. Not a, add one onto it. 
So, so what is it that, that what is it that makes your mind deal with this horror? I go, why, man? But he's seen better special effect on it. He's pretty action movie. <laughs> right. So you manage to pull yourselves together as this uh, amorphous tube sort of screams and bloop bloops its way up the hill towards you, Andy. What what is intent on doing? Right. What I'm intending on doing, unless anybody's going to object, is I'm going to fly. Ramen speed? Pretty much. Pretty much. And what I was thinking was, if we can time it right, at the last second, dig that dozer blade into the ground to raise the front wheels up just enough so we'll go up and over it, and hopefully the weight of the APC will help to squash it. <laughs> Anybody with a gun, open up at what's left. Oh, uh, right, okay, I'm loving this. Right, so you, you go towards this, it thinks it's all of its dinners have come at once as it it flies towards you and it's like, you know, slightly above jogging speed and he floors it like white knuckles grasp the uh, steering wheel as he goes towards it at slightly above jogging speed. <laughs> 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 and, and like, you know, you're doing this head-on collision thing but it just like takes about 30 seconds so it's like... Eh, and then the, the camera cuts out of the thing as you just close in a little bit more and then it goes back to Andy's face which is like wrapped with it on and he's like... Eh. So like 30 yeah. seconds later... It intercuts to me, to me in the back having to have to make it a cup of tea. Drinking it while I'm waiting. <laughs> so the moment of collision comes, Andy, you uh, you attempt to, to dig the blade into the ground. That sounds like quite a flashy manoeuvre. So I would give me, yeah, I'll, I'll, give me I'll a give flashy manoeuvre and I will oppose that with the thing's quickness. As you can probably imagine, it's not terribly quick, though. Mm. Yep, flashy, you reckon. All right, the way. right. It, it, it tries to not get run over. And I get a zero. Yeah. So you dig the blade in, the, the whole thing shudders. Give the general crew a roll of... Well, I, I hope at some point in this 30 seconds that we've actually mentioned it to them and then there could be all the intercut shots of them going, he's bloody mad. He's bloody <laughs> mad. Well, uh, half of them are like cowering on the floor in puddles of their own way. This, this horrible howling keen and wane of this creature that should not be just like claws at their minds the other half are like standing there but white faced with their guns like shaking so I, do you shout to everybody to hold on oh aye right well nobody falls off so the, cre really. the creature and the thing impact each other so can we make some opposed forceful checks please oof <laughs> Uh, you can get you get a plus two because of the size of the the blade and your, what was your flashy roll? Okay, uh, that is an an aspect a three. So you get a plus you get a plus two, but you don't get, quite get enough for a a full aspect. So you get a one shot of a plus two. So you're on plus fours. Right. They they're them funny golfing trousers, aren't they? Yeah. They yes. You're on. <laughs> you wave them in front of its its eyes. As you get um, close, I... you see that either end of the cylinder, the, it's got like an awful puckering opening with teeth in it. You're not sure which end's the arsehole and which end's the mouth, or maybe they're both. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's it's revolting, this thing. Right, so you got, you're on plus fours because of yeah. the, the size and because of your uh, stunt that you pulled. Right. Are we all rolling? No, and he's driving. Well, so that's look. that's an eight. Yep. There's a great <clears throat> thump. Uh, everybody's thrown backwards and forwards. The APC raises up. You sort of get it halfway up and it gets to the point of like tipping over backwards and then you like gun it and drop it a gear and then you, you literally go over the top of this thing, squishing the middle bit into the ground. Pseudopods come off, horrifically grabbing two of the NPCs off the, off the deck as you drive over the top and it's like... Shoo! It sort of whips them off, but you do drive over the top of it and then slowly like chug away at your just slightly above jogging pace. <laughs> this this tube is uh, squished flat in the middle and got big tire treads through the middle of it, and it's got like two NPCs on the end of uh, a tendril screaming and going, ah, ah, ah. they're shouting, "Please kill me, kill me!" 
Open fire. Mon dieu. Hmm? Basically, you can use a Gatling gun if you want. Oh, I'll, I'll try and do a, bit, um, a flashy shot and actually like, try and shoot the tendril off. Right, okay, go on then. Dif difficulty two, so that's a, a zero, uh, that's a level of success. So you you shoot the tendril off and the NBC falls onto the body of the horror where he sticks like sand, like flypaper and he's just like, Mon Dieu, you have made it worse. Ah, it burned. <laughs> you can see like he, he's, he's sticking to it and where his flesh is touching to it, it's like burning away and it's like all claggy like jam. He's yeah. going to be dead by the time we'll get back to him, isn't he? He, he is, yes. Ah. Does oh. this thing look like it's mortally wounded, by the way? It's still thrashing about. It, it can't roll because it's a bit squished and you're not sure, but it's definitely not dead. I mean, running that over something should have definitely killed it. But I reckon it, we've got to turn around and take one of the ends off. <laughs> it can have another go. We need a good, a good ooh, three mile run up. I mean, I've got a 50 50 chance. It's either its head or its arse off. <laughs> or maybe both. Or maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you spin the thing on a dime, so it's like it cuts to Andy grasping the steering wheel. Bracey's like standing there having a fag off the back, sort of like looks. He <laughs> looks at this. This thing slowly chugs round in a semicircle. <laughs> Go on then, Andy. Give us a, a forceful roll. You need. Uh, you need. You need to beat the two. We haven't got anything flammable inside this APC, have we? So with a great splutch. Uh, and a lurch, you drive over one end, and yep. severing it, and the other end sort of thrashes about. The guy who you chuck the tendril off has fallen on the top, has like sank part way in, so you can only see like the top half of his body, even though he's lying on his back, and he looks like he's been absorbed. He stopped moving, but you, you chop the end off this thing, and, and it stops moving. Woo woo, with your steam whistle. It's like a bit, a bit in a fish called Wonder when he's running him down with a steamroller and it just keeps cutting back and he can, and he's, and he's like white knuckled on this thing and it cuts back to Bracey and Davey was sitting at the back like having a fag off the back and like, right, so, so you re you retrieve them, you retrieve the spare parts and kill the whatever the hell it is, the horror, and you head back to the group. Um, so you you're missing another two MACs. Oh my god. Yeah, I, I, I apologise profusely to the rest of the crew. That wasn't my intention for people to die, but... I'll apologise for their ineptness for not holding on. So you, you get back to the convoy, universe, whatever it is, it's it's harsh and unforgiving. Uh, and it's also drizzling with a dark brown rain that sort of... It looks like it's raining like liquid mud, because like, the, the water's muddy brown... And like as it runs down your face in rivulets, it leaves like little, little trails of mud down you. It's just it's it's not steaming on. It's raining shite. <clears throat> Heading to the Camarg. I, I presume this wouldn't be the time to turn round to the rest of the crew and go. I thought I think we'd have put up more of a fight. <clears throat> yeah, as as the, the convoy like chugs over the hill in the distance, it's like you just see like one of the little tendrils sort of flicking as the convoy drives off Ooh. the caravan leader stands on the top and signals uh, waving bandana for everybody to stop and you arrive at the outskirts of the marsh outside of the Camargue so she calls a meeting for everybody so you all pull up in a circle you circle the APCs you yep. managed manage not to kill one of the APCs which is quite good over the past the past day or so, you've you've come to destroy bridges, but the APC's got big sheets of metal and girders that you've been able to either cross through the smaller ones or build temporary bridges over the other ones. And how do you make a bridge with girders? With girders. <laughs> she says, "You've pulled up on the edge of the marsh," and she says, "This is where we're supposed to be meeting nine, because it was so long ago. The only." Reference, you, you remember when you first got here, there was a wanted poster like flickering on the walls of one of the destroyed buildings with a guy with a number nine on it, and it said wanted dead. Oh, yeah, that's right, yes. It was quite a while ago. 
So you pull up on the road dirty and stain stained. You've got like, you know, you've you've got your uh, handkerchief around your face. You pull it down and like you've just got that like raccoon look off all of the stain. Uh, as you wait around 20 minutes, up limps the guy with a like a what and staff. Bears a striking resemblance to the, the picture. Uh, he's got an irregular tattoo of the number nine from his right temple to his jawline and certain in his eyes. You found you found out in the intervening in 20 minutes while you were waiting for him. He, he's basically Kung Fu. From the description, no one knows who he was, but he's seen as a legendary protector of travellers and a thorn in the side of the warlord. He also kn knows how to walk on rice without breaking it. And... Uh, <laughs> Perform various martial arts, not knowing. <laughs> Get me two cloths out, wipe on, wipe off. Uh, he, he walks slowly forward, like out of the gloom with the setting sun behind him, with his staff. The kung fu music plays as he walks forward. Mm -hmm. And he says, Welcome, Arif, I'm uh, glad you made it. How was the journey? She says, uh, It was difficult, we lost many, but... We picked these people up here and they help us. They've got some kind of military training. He says, I'm afraid to bring bad news. Aegis Mortars is besieged by Kylan's infantry, supported by his airship. He's dropping bombs on the wall, trying to breach it. To which she sort of like rubs her knuckles against the forehead. She says, then all is lost. Who are these strangers? They dress strangely. I say they do. They have put some of the clothes of the, the riders on, but... Who are you folks? And then there's a little <laughs> Kung Fu noise. <laughs> what do you mean, strange? You've never seen a kilt before? No, sir. Why do you wear the dress? Why do you not have your slave markings on? <clears throat> you don't wear a jumpsuit, now, do you have the slashes? Or the tattoos? We're no from around here, laddie. And we bow to no man. Well, this is good. Well, judging by your clothes, this planet is something... Of a dumping ground for things things that are lost. They tend to come to rest here. If you're from outside of this place, then perhaps perhaps you can help me. This help would this involve downing an airship by any chance? Very possibly, he says. I have uh, my base is in a a cave underneath the marsh. From there, I collect things that have fallen here. RF's like, well, we have nowhere else to go. He says, perhaps with your help, we may be able to break the siege. Well, I'm up for that. I mean, I don't know much about airships, but they're pretty well always guide the crash or burn or both. He gets in the cab of the lead ATV and he uh, directs you and you drive through part of the marsh, but it's only at the edge where it's... It's not so deep. The marsh only comes up to halfway through the ATVs. And can you give me a driving roll, Andy? Uh, I should be able to. Careful, probably, because you're driving carefully. You're all okay. here. The marsh is sucking down at them. Like everything else in this godforsaken place, the, the marsh is sort of brown and horrible and even more brown and plain and nondescript than a normal marshy marsh. One of the APCs uh, gets stuck, but you manage to pull it out with the witch. So there's no absolute disasters. And eventually it leads you down to this massive cavern. A big secret cavern under a marsh. Drive the APCs down in. You chug down into the cave. Inside there are the remains of three ornithopters, which are kind of like winged fighter planes, but they flap to help them oh, fly. champion. One seems more or less intact. Another one is missing the right wing and the other one's missing the half of the left wing. And inside of this set of crates scattered about the room, there's a, a strange, like, pedestal, like, completely out of place, like a sci-fi pedestal that, as he directs you to stop, number nine gets off and heads over to this sci-fi pedestal, waves his hand over it, and then a, a series of Dials or controls like light up like holographic type controls. He moves his hand about over the top of them. Great camouflage doors come out. Once the cave goes dark, he flicks another switch and there's like electronic lights come on along the other side of the cave. I'll, I'll cast my eyes over these ornithopters and all the other bits and pieces lying around and then I shall stop and just put my hand to my ear 
Is that the A team thing, Mark and I? It certainly <laughs> is. If we, only we had a cannon and a, a lifetime supply of cabbages. It says, alas, the only thought this have not worked in some time. Well, let's see what we can do about that, shall we? Indeed. Because yeah. that would make life a bit easier. Because Dave has a special ability he can repair anything once per adventure. So you, you can easily get the, the one that the frame's intact, Dave, um, by cannibalising the parts from the other two if you wanted to do that and get it, get it working. Yeah, there... sounds like this. And is there any chance we can get the one that's only missing half of a left wing going as well by using the left wing of the one that hasn't got a right wing? You say what Flight of the Navigator style. Dave can definitely have a roll at that one, but he's automatically got one fixed and he can probably fix the other one. Dave, it's going to be difficulty four. Can we help? Yes, you can. So you were, so basically, Flight of the Phoenix type thing, Dave's like hauling the wings and he's got you two like lifting them over. So you, you get plus two for helping, Dave. I turn around to number nine and go, he designs models for a living, you know. Dave's... Completely all fair with this steampunk technology, like. Oh, Good look that. at that. Right, so you've managed to cobble together two working ornithopters. Well, I should be able to fly one of them. I mean, it's only it's only driving in an extra dimension, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's just driving up and down as well as normal. Number nine gets you, uh, after you've finished doing your, your little montage, as it plays in the background, that, like, that, like Dave occasionally stops and like wipes his brow. And then gets back to it, and then uh, you get you see you cut to a bit where you and Bracey are carrying a carrying the wing across, and like one of you drops it and like j drops it on your foot, the other one sort of goes ha 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 ha. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you offend. Sorry. And the bit ahead. and the bit where Dave looks up sort of out of a hatchway, and one of us is there, and we just dab his brow with a cloth, and then he disappears again. Yeah, that kind of thing happens. Number nine says you would care to come to the back and take some refreshments. Uh, so I can, so we can speak. Certainly. He says, as you can probably guess, I'm not from this universe. Or um, neither. I gathered that by your machine. It aids my ability to move around for everybody to think of as a mysterious wonder. But obviously, I know more than what the, the natives of this dimension know. I see your reactor is completely discharged on your vehicle. I had a look when they were offloading it off the APC. Mm -hmm. We might be able to help each other. Good lad. I have a weapon in this cave that is capable of destroying the airship. I've got a weapon in this kill. <laughs> <laughs> he says, but the problem I have is I don't have anything enough to spark the weapon off because it takes a lot of power. Right. If you had anything that could effectively jumpstart the weapon, because once it breaches the roof of the cave and gets access to the what passes for sunlight on this universe, it can start absorbing its own energy waves and then uh, self-power. I look what, at like you. an alien teaser, you mean? And, and go, what have we got? Have we got anything that fits the bill? Possibly. Yeah, you've got a couple of articles of alien technology with unknown power sources. We have indeed. Odd that, isn't it? Aye. Well, I presume the best thing to do is to go and rate them out the boat of the van and go, uh, either of these any good? His eyes light up and go, I have never seen the like. Neither had we. Where on earth did you get such magnificent things? And then he's like, might I, may I touch them? I think that could be arranged. Uh, so he, like, he sort of runs his fingers over and he goes, it, 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 it's metal, but it, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like some kind of other substance. It's it's hard to get a touch on. This was not made it, by man. No, it wasn't. You're right. Uh, this is excellent. With uh, myself and George, we can rig this to the console. What we can do is we can rig this up to the console that you've seen before us with the strange symbols. And then all we need to do is somehow get the airship over the swamp. Oh, you mean like 
somebody at his bait in an ornithopter for us. What a fantastic idea. Ah, well, I guess that's my job then, is it? Might be handy. Uh, out of curiosity, those ornithopters, how many seats? A single seat. So you can pro you can fly one where anybody, any of you can fly one. Well, what about if Flay and I do the because surely we're going to be, it's going to be easier to attract an airship if there's two of us annoying it than just one. Especially when I want to be shooting it full of holes. Well, that as well. Hey, that's a thought. No, it's all right. Probably had to get far too close to use our vibro beamers, but that might put a hole in the airship with a bit of luck. I'll be rooting around these boxes, see if there's anything we can, you know, jewelry rig on the ornithopter. Good like thinking. He says, well, if we push your vehicle over against the weapon when it activates, once it breaches the roof of the cavern and starts absorbing it, I firmly believe the power in the weapon will be enough to reactivate your transport systems. Well, what have we got to lose, chaps? Because we're not going home otherwise. It's awful. Well, I would, have a, I, I would quite like to try arming these ornithopters in some way. I was just about to say, I'm going to have a route around to see if there's any, anything we can find to arm them. The only thing they have is they've got the Vickers that can dismount from the four APCs that will put two Vickers on oh, each so ornithopter. It, that's quite a trivial task for George to uh, mount Vickers on ornithopters. It's in these boxes. It's not trivial when you've always wanted to be a, uh, a World War One Royal Flying Corps pilot, it's not. Hey, I mean, uh, could also put some, like, flare launchers on it, so if they're using hydrogen, they could go up with... Good thinking. Could land on it. And cut a bloody great hole in the top. Aye, and chuck a load of sticky bombs in on timers, then uh, evac. He says, well, if you can lure it here, but the weapon should take it out from what I'm discerned from this control column. Out of curiosity, where did this weapon come from? It's embedded in the ground. It takes you over to a, an empty space towards the back of the cavern, about two thirds of the way in. And there's mm -hmm. just like the tip of a, a metallic surface uh, is slightly curved uh, as if there's something enormous underneath the metal is cool and it, it just has the appearance of like steel or, or something like that uh, but it's not corroded in any way there's just no visible signs of damage or anything like that so hang on let's let's get this straight did did you find this thing when you got here or did you bring it with you no, I found it. I've been, I've been wandering and helping people. And when I found this cavern several years ago, I found the control column, and they obviously that operated the massive doors. And I basically spent the last few years trying to decipher the column. Not a problem. Just checking. I'll just have a quick look round while I'm up here for anything that might resemble a nineteen sixties police public call box. No, no, you don't find one, unfortunately. <laughs> as much as I'd love you to, you don't I find travel one. around helping people. Aye, right. Uh, and then, as he says that, the Kung Fu music plays in the background. Do -lo -lo. <laughs> right. The day we've finished arming my only thought that I want to spray paint it red. Um, I'll have a moot through all the ammunition for these. Um, are, any, are there any tracer rounds in it? Good thinking. Uh, no, there's not many chase arounds. They're very, very simple, very simple bullets. Is there not? There's not in these in these crates with what looks like trace arounds in them, or stuff like that. No, you, you, you have a search, but the uh, number nine has already been through all the supplies in the cavern. It's mostly um, like dried key rations, like really advanced. Packaging compared to the rest of this, so it's lasted. Was there anything useful in them crates of spares we uplifted from the fort? There were 
there's some gen generally useful steam mechanisms, but the there were mostly spares for those little motorbike things. Because nothing can ever, nothing's ever going to go wrong with this plan, is it? Because that's can't thought. say it, can't say it myself. Genius, this is. Andy Dunnan, like a, a pair of flying goggles and a helmet. I'll, uh, I'll I'll have the white silk scarf, but I'll leave the egg whisk at home. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, I assume you help him wire this, uh, the, two, yeah. the two alien artefacts in the control panel. Um, yeah, yeah. Stuff. Right, so basically, uh, you do all of your montaging. Well, I might... If yeah, if he's painted his red, I might as well have mine done up like a sock with puff. Right, <laughs> okay, so you paint your, with like the big circles on and everything. Oh, aye. And we'll make sure the knocker is fully charged. A couple of our vibro beamers, just in case we need them. It's it's coming up to dawn, just as you've completed all of the, the work. Uh, you've had a few hours sleep, but not much. Uh, Dave's pretty much worked all night. The sun rises, Dave flips the switch on the control panel, the big giant uh, cave doors drive open. You two climb into the cockpits of your ornithopters and then what do you see as you, you take off into the sunset? I feel the need, the need for reasonably slow speed. Top Gun style, Brissy's like, Brissy's flaps lifts off as Andy's does just a few seconds after and then in a formation you sort of swoop out of the cave you fly off over the swamp uh, as you approach the gates of Aegis Mort it's a great big coastal city with like a massive castle wall built in a semicircle all the way around you can see explosions going off at the wall you can see a great army around the outside laying siege to it a lot of those beast men running about hovering over them there's this massive massive like dreadnought of a an airship uh, the, the top of it glints it looks like it's got sheet metal over the top half underneath it's like bristling with gondolas and the bottom half of the balloon is uh, painted black with a, a great big screaming red face on it uh, it's slowly going backwards and forwards across the battlefield uh, dropping bombs and where bombs fall over the wall you, a big explosion there's a, a couple of shots fired back up but they don't seem to have any kind of weapon that's capable of damaging this horrendous thing well I think the best thing we can do is uh, is climb and come at it from above and, and give it a couple of bursts and see if we can get its attention can I have like a careful, uh, I don't know, just analysis to see if the, you know, can we, can we spot a weak spot? Is there an, you know, an engine that we could go for on the side or something like that, which would blow the not pieces? One of them, not one of them little tiny exhaust ports at the funny angle, is there? Yeah, yeah that would be a, a create an advantage. You can have certainly have a roll with a three. So that is enough for a boost, which is a one shot of plus two. Right, you re you you can see that even though this, this thing seems to be like the biggest thing in the air, that on this country at least, it's built over armoured. It's, it's not, you know, scientifically sound. It's big and quite slow, but... The, the sheets of corrugated iron have been welded around the engines and it's got this big aluminium roof on to stop damage. It's almost like it shouldn't really exist, to be honest. But you reckon you reckon you could get at one of the engengines, although it would be quite difficult. So I'll pass us on information on Andy. Yeah, on your communications. You're like, Fox One, Fox One, yeah, spotted, a, spotted a weakness in the engine. What, what? You climb up into the sun... Uh, from a, a vast distance out, you get over. Uh, I assume you're very high up, and you go into the sun. And then what do you do? Um, I'm going to make a pass at the engine, but what I don't want to do is, you know, dive. So I've gone below below it where all the guns are. Right. I want to go beforehand, um, so there's a minimum chance of them firing at, at me with the weapons on the side. Right. So you come screaming down out of the sun. Uh, Tally Hill. 
tally ho, chaps, what, what? Uh, you sort of, you do that thing where you're hovering in midair as you, your only thought that just kind of flaps its little wings and keeps you there, and then you just sl- lazily lean off to one side and then, like, go into a spiral and dive, and as you get closer, like, dagger, 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 dagger. Andy, are you, are you following him, or are you just staying above there? Are you on guard? I'll follow him on the other side, because pr- I presume these engines are in pairs? Yes. Well, I'll go for the engine, like, on the other side of the one of the one he's going for. Diving out of the sun, catching it completely by surprise, you, you can... See? What happens when you fly straight and level in the combat zone for more than 30 seconds? Somebody yeah. should tell their pilot. <laughs> you dive in, go on, make us a roll, forceful with your guns. You dive down, bullets stitch along the engine, but the patter on the outside and bounce off. Again, on the other side, you dive down. This this thing is insanely armoured for an airship. Uh, to be honest, if the air pressure and gravity was Earth normal, the, the thing probably bloody wouldn't fly. But bullets stitch down the side of the... Uh, off the armoured roof, down the side, along the stubby wing, and, and bounce off the corrugated iron, protecting the engine. Any chance I could boost my roll by one by using a fate point to shoot the propeller off. Not damage the engine, but to just clip the propeller. Use fate points for anything you like. I uh, Actually, I've only got three fate points because there's only three years, so I get three fate points because I'm that kind of GM. But I can also spend them as well. So you, you can state it and you can have roll a fate point if you want and just tell me what you yeah, want. I'll, u- I'll use a fate point. Just to just to take not to damage the engine, but just to take the propeller off that side. With a bit of luck, this ought to get their attention. Yes. But also, also it either slow them down or make it just that little bit more difficult for them to manoeuvre. Yeah. Good thing. So that draws equal to the five. So you, you you pull up just slightly, and the bullets stitch across the engine, just chopping the tip off one of the. Uh, the propeller blades the engine sort of makes a, a wild whining noise as the the weight on the engine shifts um and basically then you see like crew running around the gondola on the outside they're like spotted you know, the, the 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 waving and the pointing and they've got like and, and i presume we're pulling up yes and I, as you as you, you you come out you dive and you start you climb again towards the sun uh the the airship slowly sort of starts turning to match uh, match your v- vector so they can bring bring guns to bear. So you climb back up. Uh, th- that was your surprise round because they think they had no idea what was happening. Do you think that's enough, or do you need a little bit more? Well, if, if we've got two choices, I guess. We, we ideally we want them to follow us now, but if they don't, why don't we just go and land on the roof where they kind of get their guns to bear? <laughs> Because we're supposed to shoot it down, that's why. Border action, yeah, but it did do a nice bit of border action. Of course, there's only two of us who could go horribly wrong. There is only two of you, like, <laughs> like you know, th- th- think this massive, like, steampunk warship, flying warship y thing. It, it does hold quite a lot of beast. You could always but you, you, of, you are, you are, you are very welcome to land on top of it and go hand to hand it. That is perfectly all right. <laughs> I, I wasn't really thinking of going hand to hand. I, I was thinking of, of it, how how it might enrage the captain. The the thought that I've just landed on top of his airship, and I'm just sitting there quite happily, and he can't get any guns to bear on me, because if he does, he'll have to fire through his own airship. I don't suppose our vibro beamers would cut through this shape metal on the top, would it? Possibly, but it's unlikely. It does it does seem to be extremely well armoured. You know when we flow past it? Yes. What does the cockpit look like? Like any open windows, any open windows, doors, portals, anything on the gondola? Um, no, there wasn't like a, a cockpit as such that you could see. There was um, there was open doors from the sides with like a, a run rear around the outside of the gondola where that's where the people are running out. The engine, although it's still functional, it's like obviously it changed and the whole airship should. Right, so the airship starts starts slowly raising up, and uh, you can just see like movement as as people are running about. But you've you so far you've climbed up above it, so they can't shoot at you. What do you want to do now? Question is, how are we going to get it to chase us? Well, we could just keep finding the crap out of like the crew and stuff like that. You know, like a bloody 
couple of gnats annoying an elephant. I mean, um, do you think we've done enough to get it to follow us? Probably not. Um, yeah, uh, sadly, that's what I was. Well, thinking. it's certainly it's certainly turned round. But if you're gonna, are you gonna dive down and have another go at it? I've got a mm. feeling I might have to do some of flashy here. Yeah. Did you say there was crew running out to try and sort that engine? Out? Yes. Well, they're all they're running out around the on the gondola around the outside, attending to various ship mounted weaponry that's mounted on the side because the weaponry can fire like downwards <coughs> at an angle or to like you know it's on a pin L mount kind of thing but a very primitive sort of pin L mount could I could uh, hose these guys dead a couple of turns Not yeah I was volume. thinking that I was wondering if we could approach the airship so we're largely sheltered by the engine, if you say what I mean. So, like, if they try to bring the guns to bear, they'll have to shout through their own engine to hit us while we shout at them. And if we happen to hit the engine by accident, oh, what a shame. Yeah, so that sounds like you're trying to create an advantage for the manoeuvre first. So what you need to do is... Uh, want to create an advantage. Flashy or quick, possibly? Are you staying in formation? Are you diving to either side? or? We'll stay in formation for this one. Well, I've only got flushier two, so three. So you get a boost. You both dive in, uh, in the shelter of the engines. You can see these men clad in their best madman firing at you with guns from the, the side rail. So you get that plus two. You can either give that to Andy to fire this round or you can hold it till the next round for your attack. I'll hold it for now. Um, By all means. And I'll see how many I can take out, and then if Annie needs it, I'll give it Andy. Right, because this turn you create an advantage, you see. So mm -hmm. then, yeah. now, Andy, you can either fire, you can create an advantage. But the crew are going to yeah. open up on you as you come round. You see now that you've dropped lower, below the, the level of the metal shell. The bomb aimer is actually in the best style of Mad Max. There's a guy, there's a, a big, looks like a big metal hatch, uh, and he's mm -hmm. strapped to the outside of this big metal hatch with, like, some kind of binocular things gaffer taped to his face. This is this is what the, passes as a bomb aimer, and he's sort of screaming, going, ah! <laughs> can I shoot him then? I was going to say they'll be annoyed if we kill him you can absolutely shoot him yeah oh they will and all won't they I think he's got to go so you are rolling forceful aren't you against this guy yeah you roll lazily over with uh, your machine guns yak the tatter tatter and the, the guy explodes in a spray of blood on the front of the <laughs> on the front of the airship uh, while a whole bunch of shite is going to come out shite comes your way there's like like arrows from spear launchers there's crossbow bolts come flying out there's some bullets getting fired out. Um on the side there's one guy got like a hand cranked figures going duck -a -duck -a -duck -a -duck -a -duck -a so all this shite like the kitchen sink is, is flying towards you well as the kitchen sink flies past I shall pause and wash my hands <clears throat> 20 seconds remember exactly yes happy birthday twice <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a bit late, a bit late now to ask if we had parachutes. So, can you please defend with your quickness as you uh, try to roll madly out of the way? Hopefully, uh, I've got anything that would work for this. The kitchen sink at Andy gets a two, and the kitchen sink at Bracey Oof. four. Right. What, so, what, what are we rolling with quickness? Yes. To I may need a fate point here. Right. I am as well. So there's a, a great big spear, spear throw thing, sticks in the side of the, the plane, Bracey, and mm -hmm. uh, you can feel the controls. It's jammed one of the cables or something, and like the left rear tail flappy bit uh, won't do it, and your machine has taken like one. Okay. The, also, there's like a line of bullets get stitched along the cockpit just next to your legs. All right, Andy, you got a two, and they got a two, so that's a zero. Narrowly missing you. You see all of the, You see this big spear thing sticking the side of Bracey's only thought because it's only made out of like balsa wood and uh, tissue paper, basically. Uh, uh, you 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 quickly roll to the side as the burst of bullets just whistles where just where you were. 
but it misses by like a fraction. You, you, and, it and, parts your hair. And as I do, I'll hook me kilt up and slap me bare ass out the side of the cockpit at them. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you notice that Bracey seems to be having some problem, some jammed cable, so he's not quite as manoeuvrable as he was, but he, he's still flying at the moment. It's the little the little tail feather thing, uh, main wing's jammed. And presumably there's not a thing I can do about it. Not unless you, you fly next to him and then leap out of your plane, landing on the back of his plane, then pulling the thing out and then sticking your hand in the wall and wiggling the, the wire. I mean, I'm all up for you having a go. Uh, well, if it gets desperate... We might have to land on top of the airship. That would be terrible. Right, so the, uh, the airship has turned to follow you. Increases to maximum speed. Um, oh, shall, shall we just bug out and call it even? I, I, I think we should flap off as quickly as we possibly can, actually. You fly off as quick as you possibly can. You began to rapidly outdistance the airship in the direction of the cave. But then what happens is some weird thing happens. There's like a big sort of a cough and a big belch of steam and the the pitch of the engines rises as if they've like fired some kind of weird archaic nitrous oxide and the uh the airship <coughs> leaps forward at, at definitely unsafe speed like two people that were hanging on the sides just fall off and <laughs> uh, and, and it's so it it sort of starts very slowly closing the distance between you but uh, at the moment you reckon you probably just get back to the gate right so as you fly to the the surface of the cave dave's communicator comes in range again what's happening lad uh, we're being chased by an airship we'll start sighting on it then mm-hmm. we've got the fire crews yeah we we'll on my landing <clears throat> tell number nine it's coming to all... right you and number nine are on Console together. They seem to have done something with their engines and they're moving faster than they were. So I don't know I don't know if that means they've got some sort of technology up here that, that we didn't know they had, but I'm just letting you know. Uh, apparently they fired their hand wavium boosters. That's the one. You approach the cave. The airship is just outside of gunnery range, uh, as if by some kind of divine fiat. It's just outside the gun range, and th- then there's a cough and a splutter, and it starts to slow down again. But you are so close now. We're going to go for an emergency we... landing in the cave. Oh, <laughs> like like uh, like the rebels on Yavin Four. Yep. <laughs> Do you think it's worth landing one of the ornithopters in the marsh on the top of the cave, like exactly where we want them? It's certainly worth a go. Again, you yeah. can roll a def- uh, an advantage. Uh, I would say that's false. Uh, Flashy, or cl- possibly clever. I would, I would go for clever. Well, I can do that if you want, because your yours is damaged. I'd rather you've got back safe. Yeah. And then just, I'll just pl- I'll just plodge back through the marsh. I, yeah, as long as you plodge quickly. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you what. I will plodge like there's an airship chasing me. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. For, for hook line and only thought there. Now, Jolly good. So you, you come into a landing, you don't even turn the ignition off, you hop out of the uh, canopy, the wing's just like fluttering in place position, uh, run down to the gate, the, the airship comes overhead, <laughs> as it gets in gun range you just see all the like, spear throws from ballastier, there's like machine gun fire comes down, poor ornithopters just raked with bullets and spears and then just start smoking and then the wings collapse as it collapses to the ground and then there's a hit on the boiler a big explosion as the boiler goes off but that's enough uh you run into the entrance of the cave and bracy's already landed there and and jumped out what do you do now uh scream something like no <laughs> is it in rain it is yes fire you quickly press a few of the, the controls. You've got wires running from that alien technology into a USB port in the side of the gate. Both the alien artifacts start sparking as you, you fire the uh, charges from the alien power cells. In. The ground begins to shake. The rock uh, falls from the ceiling and this great shape starts to emerge from the bottom of the, the cavern. Perfect pyramidal shape. The spars of metal 
form it and, and the inside of the spars initially you can see through it but then they start to shimmer and shake whole part of the it pushes upwards through the floor till it reaches the ceiling of the cavern then starts pushing through the surface of the cavern sparks of energy shooting off it you've got the the van up against it the van is like because it's a pyramid it's been slowly pushed to one side but you can see the energy transference into the pyramid is quite huge and then horribly you kind of recognize what it is uh, you're like hang on a minute i've seen something similar to that before because it's never easy is it there's going to be a picture in a minute, isn't there? There is going to be a picture now. Out of fire, there might have been. This thing pushes through the surface. Oh, for fuck's sake. Uh, there's, you can see the ornithotters. You can see the scale of it. This thing's like 60 metres on an edge. It goes through the surface. As the peak crests through the top, sunlight strikes it. Energy pours down. You can see it's almost as if it's sucking pure energy out of the air and runs down the surface of the pyramid you recognize it as a disruptor gate the rooks you fought on the steps of st paul's uh, carried a much smaller version where they clipped together what looked like aluminium poles what do you do above you there's a massive discharge of energy there's a, a huge explosion which rocks the cavern again uh, and bits of debris begin to fall to the ground it's not technically a weapon but it seems to have destroyed the airship above you what do you do now has the van got a full charge well the van is like leaning on its side at the moment on, on the gate and you can see sort of like energy sparking around it do you think we should get rid of turned off yep only one thing to do here really he says well now that i've got full access to the control panel i can't turn it off now that it's got access to the energy the sunlight it's not uh, exactly what i thought it was it just said it was something about high energy subsystems emission and well you know it did <laughs> did the airship in what do you do chaps would it help if we destroyed the, the controls lads probably not we need the block off the sunlight to it, so it stops, um, sort of powers. He says, as, as he's reading the dials, he says, uh, well, it's basically a, a, a gate between you. If you can push the van through it, you'll have gotten out of this universe, which was the problem you had starting the van. All you got to do is push the van through the gaps. Where the lines are, are like it's like just a thick aluminium tube. The white space is gap. Disruptors send troops, tanks, stuff like that through, through these bigger gates. Or at least they did before they all died. Is there any way to dial in a location on this disruptor? No. The disruptor gate seems to have been preset, but you do do, 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 do press on the readout to see where it comes out. And it says that uh, it's programmed to go to the dark. Have I heard anything about this, the dark? The dark is a Europe-sized space station, or it was. It's in the Disruptor's home universe. But then Luther blew up the Disruptor's home universe, uh, killing apparently killing all life forms in the universe, leaving it an irradiated mess. Ah. So but he coming. says, number nine says, you'll only be in there a second, you'll be fine. It's got to be better than being stuck here. No offence. Get pushed, um, lads. Right. Um, get, get the van put on its way. Get in it. Turn the engines on and tractor into the... Well, if you remember, this one can move under its own power. Between the three, drag it upright and then slowly work it forward. You still haven't started the atomic pile, but there's enough power now uh, in, the, in the internal batteries that you can jump once you're outside of the Splinter Universe. Okay, no. So I think the best thing to do is set the controls for home and then when we fall through this gate and drop out the other side then fire it and go home in theory. Yeah. Depending on how many pages there are in this scenario. 
<laughs> it sounds like a plan to me. You do that. You uh, you all jump in the thing. Dave programs the controls. RF is like, wait, what is this? Uh, number nine says he's gone. He uh, he's gone for good now. You're free, and she was like, yeah, but free to go where? And see, I stand in there like looking bemused, as if to say, well, uh, what do we do? And just as you do that, you trundle across the event horizon. And the last word you hear is, well, I wouldn't follow us, pet. Uh, <laughs> so you fall and it's a different sensation. It's more like going straight down a deep hole. Whereas the other one, like it's like a sickly feeling where your stomach flips. This is just like, <laughs> like, like you've just fell off an immediate like thousand foot drop. For just a second, you uh, appear in another universe you're uh, all the breaths suck from your lungs you feel an intense burning like sunburn but dave's like sitting with his hands over the controls with the finger on the button you just catch a brief sign hanging in space of a part of the disruptive world ship like i said it's a massive black construct it's it's not any kind of shape it seems to be spheres and boxes all sort of welded together the size of europe it's cracked in the middle and the two halves have sort of sagged down at an angle and they're just joined by a few pieces one thing you do see is what looks like to be a space dock that there appears to be one of those brass krakens that you've seen before but its sides torn open and its tentacles at one end hang lip but it looks like it was docked at the dock and then with a, a flash vehicle pops out of existence and reappears in zero zero you immediately can take your breath in because you've been holding your breath and you're like <gasps> as you look at each other the people in the re- return room are like holy shit there's a whole load of alarms go off the radiation counters on the wall start like instantly go red and start blaring the security guard the door <laughs> slams the emergency lock locking the door and you look at each other, you're all sunburned. Right, I climb, I climb gingerly out of the van, because I know how painful sunburn can be. I walk round to the back of it, and I start kicking it. You useless piece of bloody shite. <clears throat> Substandard fucking power pack. And I'm probably still doing that when somebody turns up. You probably are. Right, there's an emergency medical team turn up within 30 seconds in full hazmat gear. They're sort of... They attach a machine by a, a big tube and say, this is decontam spray. You might feel a bit of discomfort as the, like, the whole room is flooded. You know, like a foam party. There's just oh, like this pump of noise in the whole room is f- instantly flooded with this. As it settles on you and sort of dries, the, the radiation counter goes down a little. And they come in in the hazmat suits and they're like, where the friggin' hell have you been? They'll be like, that, ri- that irradiated? You just caused it just caused a class alpha, a class alpha red emergency. A medical team runs in and they see the state of you and they're like, Jesus Christ <laughs> and start injecting you with drugs with fancy auto docs and Tell them about Earl's um yeah. in Earl Squid. So they're like, Oh yes, we will definitely destroy that. <laughs> Aye, because if you think I'm having a cot in our apartment, you are very much mistaken. The way of the medical, the, the Bones McCoy medical scan over a minute, so it goes boom, 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 boom. Okay, right, well, you lot are going straight to an isolation ward until we get you levelled out. Not so. for 14 days, by any chance. Aye, 14 days. Before you're even debriefed, you're taken off into a secure isolation ward, pumped full of anti radiation drugs. And even though you were only in the dark for a second, in serious danger of radiation poisoning. Luckily, because of the advanced technology, you're finally okay, although you have a really bad skin burn all over your body, uh, like you've got no eyebrows. You know when you get those that big, paly bit of skin burn and like you just pale it off in one big shade? <laughs> Does that mean I can do the, hey, lads, lads, come and look at this, and I'll switch the light out and I'm still glowing like a ready breath kid? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and yes, so you are back at zero, zero, all in one piece. Well, mostly one piece. Hooray! Yeah. And that's it for the evening. That is the end of the adventure.